This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Today I'm speaking with Diem Fuggersberger, CEO and co-founder of Burger Ingredients and the creator of Coca and Lucas's kitchen brand, providing ready-made meals that cater for kids with allergies, which is a big issue in Australian society and beyond. Her self-made success story from refugee without any possessions to a business powerhouse is pure inspiration, showcasing what Australia can do so well as a truly multicultural nation. I'm so excited to have Diem here to unravel the politics of kids' food. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So starting very uh, very much at the beginning, uh, for people who don't know you, you fled Vietnam as a child refugee and ended up in Indonesia before coming to Australia. Tell us a little bit about what your early childhood was like. My most beautiful childhood I could remember is spending a lot of time with my grandmother. Um, my grandmother raised me from when I was born to about seven and a half. So during that time, my grandmother, she's Chinese, she's taught me a lot and everything she's taught me has, you know, has carried me through life. So when I left Vietnam, I, I really, really missed her. So we, um, our journey was to travel. My mum has organised it with the boat owner that our family and extended family uh, with another 504 refugees to go on a 25 meter boat and the boat was 0010 and we travel we forecast to travel from Vietnam to the nearest Indonesian island which is Galang Galang so we get there within three days and on the boat there was just enough snacks and water but there wasn't proper meals or food or you don't get a bedroom and there was probably a couple of toilets for us to share so during the three days we were intercepted by pirates and we um, of course they took all our belongings and gold but what was for me horrifying is when they tried to nearly rape my two cousins but I think they ran out of time so luckily they gave my cousins back and they threatened to nearly throw one man overboard because he had gold teeth so we say you know please don't do it we'll give you whatever you want and then after that there was a huge huge big storm and we just thought you know that the, the boat's going to capsize and we're going to all get you know we're all going to die so in a situation like that you just pray and pray and pray so that that's my that's what i remember most of my childhood and then the next step is coming to australia as a refugee that's an incredible early yeah. start to life i believe you didn't even know your real birthday for many years and how did that get discovered for, for a long time, you know, I didn't really celebrate my birthday because I didn't know what's the real birthday, but mum couldn't remember it. So the reason I didn't know my birthday is when we were in refugee islands, we had our visas. And, um, you know, I don't know why dad changed everyone's birthday. Like he even changed his age. And for mine one, he changed the two dates. So he changed it to 18 of April. And my real birthday is... 14 of August 1971 and I only found this is when dad passed away in uh, 14 of January 2011 and then after when my dad passed away um, on the 14 of August which is my real birthday uh, mum went through all his belonging and she found my birth certificate so even to this day my birthday is due wrong on all my passport and license. So I need to get my actual birth certificate verified in Vietnam and signed before birth and marriages and death in Australia can change it for me. And I hope I can do that beginning of 2018. Totally fascinating. I guess you get to get two birthday cakes. That there's, yeah. some, there's some benefits <laughs> to it. What role did home cooking and food play for your family as you were growing up? How important was food? Well, you know, we, my mum is a butcher. And we've always, mum has always been very selective and she's very pride, tech pride. Like she's, we're always surrounded by food. 
So mom has always cooked for us. So it doesn't matter how busy my mom is. She and she had nannies to look after us. But my mom always cook for us and she will always cook us three meals a day so when we were at dinner that's where we share our our stories so you know activities with food we always have cousins come over and that would be because i had 250 relatives in australia so if we had a party it would be about food all day so it's always few activities and i learned about food is because from seeing how my mother cooked and my mom was always very very selective about seasonal produce so whether it's her meat, her fish, her spices, or her seafood, we all, I'm always surrounded by food. So food for me is joy. It makes me happy and it brings my family together. Perfect. I think many cultures feel the same about yes. food. Meeting your husband sounds like it was a life-changing moment for you. Did he introduce you to the world of food ingredient production? And how did you really get involved in the business you're in now? Well, meeting my husband really, you know, brought in my, my, my perspective because I have always grown up to just live in the one area. I've never really traveled. So Verna has really opened the whole world to me. And I find that, you know, um, German cuisine oh, is quite basic and they eat a lot of small goods. Whereas the difference between my cuisine and the European cuisine is we eat a lot of fresh so we eat a lot of whole foods and we don't really believe in processed food or tin can food. So I've always been eat, brought up to eat like made everything from scratch, fresh, and you, you buy your produce in the morning and you cook in the evening. And um, I think I have really professionally got into food is when we lost our everything in 2009 where we lost the $27 million and we were homeless. And that's why I go, you know, Verna, you've got a very special, unique talent. You've got a good reputation. My family and I have a can-do attitude. And I think we sort of like join force together to, to make food and make it happen. So, so that's what I think has happened. Like we have different skill set and I look at it as yin and yang and that's how we incorporate ourselves to work together and I just think okay if it's just Vernon and I we can't really do much but if we have a whole tribe of my family we can really move mountains and move yeah. mountains you have yeah. so you started your first business uh, in 2010 and you were producing seasoning and flavor concepts for various types of meat and fish products and your clientele does span from butcher shops to food manufacturing companies and to leading Australian supermarkets it sounds epic and you have four indigenous flavored sausages called Outback Spirit that were exclusively for Coles at the time and you decided to donate a portion of that to the Coles Indigenous Food Fund so there's a bit of philanthropic effort in there as well how did that journey t what did it really teach you about food manufacturing in australia are we all about convenience and quality what what do australians really want in their food you know australians are very savvy uh, i think we're very lucky that we are very multicultural and how i and, and but australians are also have high expectations but at the same times you know how there's i've noticed there's two brackets there's actually the, the brackets where you supply to all 99% of the population and they're very price sensitive. So when I'm working on a project, besides having the innovation and being a disruptor and wanting our, our forte is gourmet, artisan, clean labeling, no E numbers, but I've always in the back of my mind, price sensitive. And that, so, so I, and then there's the other brackets where you have the, all the high end stores like the lifestyle stores. So that's where, that probably makes up five to 10% of the population. And that's where they're willing to pay a bit more for homegrown produce. So I'm a big believer in just working with 95% of country of origin uh, because I want to support the local farmers and growers. And getting back to the outback spirit is I, I don't know what, but I always have a very, very um, sincere, um, genuine towards the landowner, which is the Aborigines. And I just think Australia is a very, very good country. It has given my 250 relatives visas in Australia, and we are able to have a second life in Australia to start again. So I feel it's my compelling responsibility to give back. So when I did the, um, I used the Outback Spirit ingredients, their ingredients are very strong. 
and it's very expensive. So if you're comparing, for example, a normal pepper is about $30 a kilo, but if you're using a pepper berry of the Aboriginal uh, spice, it's about $99 a kilo. That's hugely so, different. Yeah, So, but for me, I wanted to use that because I wanted that Aboriginal um you know who's growing the the the, the, the special um, ingredients like lemon myrtle to you know we need to appreciate that the land that we live in and their spices are very special and I I I'm still since 2011 still donating to the Aboriginal food funds and it still goes on so we if we counted it back we probably um, donate at least $60,000 to the Aboriginal Food Funds and we still continue doing that with uh, farm foods in Geelong in collaboration with Coles. So, um, yeah, so it's, we, I like to actually contribute or donate from my own pocket. That That's more my style. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Jumping into the topic of today, which is about kids' food, your kids' frozen meals is more of a foodie range for kids, and I love the, I love the name of it as well. And you've named it after your nephew and your daughter, so it's very, very special, I imagine, to you. It is Australia's first junior food range that's gluten and lactose-free, and it's obviously available in major supermarkets and other outlets for, like you say, the 95% of the population. Tell us a little about the path to creating this part of your your food empire. How did you how did you get involved? How did I get involved? Um, after working with my husband for five years and you know setting up Burger successfully um, and making it a very robust business, um, and because I'm not able to work in fashion, I wanted to always make something beautiful because I I love being surrounded by things that are beautiful so I go what can I do because you know when I had Sophia and Coco I never bought food because I, when I read the ingredients decoration I was never comfortable to to feed my kids so I think what started it is more when Lucas was born he um, he had all these allergies and being you know Vietnamese we didn't even know what gluten uh, lactose lupin and when he was diagnosed with all these allergies like he couldn't eat anything it has to be lactose free, gluten free, he can't have lupin, he can't eat seafood, he can't eat eggs, he can't eat seed, he can't eat nuts and um, you know and he can't even drink like we've been brought up to drink a normal formula like S26 and he can't even take that so we were very worried when he was given soya, soya milk and he lost a lot of weight and uh, my niece Jessica had um, a very very hard time with that so I go I can imagine there's at least two to four percent of Australians that has that same problem. Uh, problem, and as soon as I go to a store, a high-end store, and people selling food that is gluten-free or lactose-free, the price is very high. Absolutely, and, and, it's and a market just, for sure. Yeah, and then I, when I see people go handmade, people are expected to pay astronomical prices. But a mum who's got kids with these allergies, they might not be you know, high income earners. So I just go, why should they miss out? So I really spent nine months just focusing on the, the, the allergies, like all my heart and my effort. Uh, I even funded myself without getting paid to make sure that I get it to perfection. So if just for an example, um, a, um, a gluten-free flour. So I only found one, it was a lucky flower, but when I look at the back of the ingredients decoration, there was a lot of E numbers, and I didn't want to use that. So my husband developed a flower for, for me. So, you know, it took me a long time to get it to perfection just because it's gluten-free or lactose-free. I wanted to taste amazing, and I did a lot of tests. I did up to 600 samples to get it to perfection. And I had even two assistants helping me just in the process of developing the, the range. And the other one is um, my daughter, Coco. Coco always wanted me to cook for her. Uh, she's a bit of a perfectionist. And when she, she's very much on, you know, the look of, of, of the meal, it has to be displayed nicely. It has to be cut nicely. And the portion has to be perfectly. So I just feel, you know, when I look at the market, there's food created for zero to six months, uh, which is milk. And then there's food for kids between six months to two, 18 months. And there's food for kids between two years to four years. And there's foods for adults, but there's a gap between three to 13. 
and they if a three year old can't eat three hundred and fifty grams. So I just go, you know, I, I, I wanted to tick the nine boxes and I did, I wasn't in the position to have a marketing person or I can buy scan data and my husband keep on pushing me to buy scan data. And I said, Verna, I'm actually creating a brand that never existed, so there's no skin data. And I go, just because no one has created it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Uh, You're a pioneer, Yeah, damn. so I want to be, you know, the champions for kids' wellness in Australia. So I wanted to tick a few boxes. So the first box was time poor for mums. I wanted to make sure that it was at least 90% country of origin because I do care and respect the local farmers and growers. I look at demographic growth. There's a top percent growth in that category. I looked at, you know, eco-friendly because 95% of my packaging is biodegradable. I looked at um, junior foodies movement because kids these days, they don't want to just eat. They want to Instagram the food. They want to Facebook the food. They have their opinion. And I wanted the, the, the packaging to speak art. Because kids these days don't want to be, want to be patronised to have Sesame Street on it. They want to be arty and cool. And I look at nutrition. So my food is 33% carb, 33% vegetables, and 33% protein. And I looked at, um, you know, just the whole wellness of it. So I want so a very holistic approach. Holistic approach. And I wanted mum to trust me. Mum to trust me to pick up my meal and say it looks like someone like grandma or auntie or mum cooked it. So that that was my vision. And the other thing is my food ha- contains no preservatives, no additives and no colouring. And I know that I'm not a doctor to confirm it, but I'm actually working, leaning towards chronic disease for kids. Because when I look at, you know, um, things like, um, you know, autism, and uh, my mum having diabetes and all these chronic sickness, what it is is you need to eat it healthy and naturally and no processed food. And it's about respecting our environment. So, so that was my, my, my heart. It's amazing. I, I can hear the passion when I chat to you about it. Yeah. You touched on food allergies and obviously your nephew had a lot of them. Mm-hmm. They seem to be increasing in Australia and of course you're not a doctor so we, we don't expect you to give us a medical answer but do you have any sort of insight into you know how big an issue it is, is for families and I guess what we can do maybe with what we eat because we're told you know, so many conflicting things. Like I remember when I had my child, no peanuts for the first nine months. Now in our culture of Jewish heritage, Israelis give their kids peanuts in snacks and things and tahini and sesame seeds very early because that's their diet. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, in Israel, there's hardly any nut allergy, like none at all. And I I don't know whether there's any science in that and whether you've been exposed to any of the data, but what do you understand about the growth of food allergies in Australia and how we can deal with it? I think back in 2010, there was only like 2%. Now it's increased to 4%. And these days, people eat a lot of gluten-free or lactose-free or there's diets like paleo, which is cave moon food. It's, it's more like 25%, up to 25% that people are eating, restricting all those food just for lifestyle. So an incident also happened to my husband. My husband went to Vietnam uh, three years ago and after he landed, he was really, really, really sick and he was hospitalized straight away and they diagnosed him incorrectly and they put a tube down his, um, you know, his tummy, which made it worse. So when we came back, I met with a very special um, Nobel Prize doctor. He's Polish, Jewish, and his name is Dr. Barodi. And he helped my doctor, uh, he helped my husband. So it was, you know, with food allergies. Did it, you find out if it was an allergy at the end of the day? It what is, was, yes. it, it was gluten, so we straight away cut out gluten, lactose, and that he was incorrectly diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And he was given steroids, and the steroids didn't react well with him. So when he took steroids, half of his body shut down. So it means that he was totally numb, and he at one stage hyperventilated in the street, and I had to call an ambulance. So I think in my husband's case, he went to see Dr. Barodi, and Dr. Barodi treated him by putting the good... Um, the good um, what's the word? Good like he gave him a treatment to help him, and even after the treatment, he has to wean off gluten free and lactose free. But that took over a year. Oh, so now he can eat gluten, gluten and, and lactose. lactose. Interesting. But it took 
a year to win it off. Yes. But in Lucas' case, no. Because he's a How old's Lucas now? He's five. Okay. And even yesterday when I spoke to his mum, his case is too severe. So, so he may never grow out of it. He never may grow never grow out of it. So I think with this it's really very individually treated. So for example, I went out with Lucas, like he had, you know, a gelato. And the gelato had a tiny bit of milk in it. That's enough to, you know, like his throat will burn. He will make it really sick and then he will throw up and it will take him another three hours to settle down. So it, it is very tricky for mums whose kids that has allergies because they have to spend hours and a lot of money to prepare the food in advance because they can't eat in restaurants. Exactly. And, Going and, away and on holidays must be yes, a nightmare or go to yeah. birthday parties where yes. you don't really know what's in the food. Yeah. So, for example, I, I, I when I developed this, you know, I haven't been paid for two years. Uh, I'm actually... You know, because I, my vision is so strong and I don't have fear even though, you know, I'm not making any money. in the. I'm happy to not make money in the first two years because I want to have awareness and I've already spent $3 million. But I just knew it wasn't for me. So it wasn't about the money or the dollar or the profits. It was the passion and I was trying to solve a problem. And for me, that that what matters at the end of the day. Yes. Absolutely, and I'm sure you'll be very successful. Yeah. So what are your grand business plans for um, Coco and Lucas's Kitchen? Do you think you'll sell it one day? I mean, it's obviously early days. Do you, have you have an exit strategy or is it just too early to think about that? Um, I do have a um, very big vision for Coco Lucas because when I launched Coco Lucas, you know, I love that word, wellness champion for kids in Australia. So I really want to be the queen of kids in Australia. Like, I want to make sure that my brand is a, you know, an authentic brand. I'm building an authentic brand, a trusted brand, a respected brand. So that's why the three big things for me is the three C's. So my first C is my client, which is like Coles, Woolworth, Aldi, um, and the high-end stores. My second C is through social media. So that's through Twitter, through Instagram, through LinkedIn, through um Facebook. So through those channels, I get feedback every single day to say, Yimi, your brand's good, you need to fix this. They give me feedback every day. I talk to them every day. I talk to 24. I want to speak to 24 million Australian people that's giving me feedback every day. So I'm not actually passing that to an admin person. I personally manage that because I want to hear from the... Not much sleep for you, Dean, yeah, by the sounds of it. Yeah. And then the third C is brand loyalty, the community. The community is... If the community is loyal to me, the brand is going to be alive. So the plans I have for Australia is I want to be very known. I want I know that there's 5,000 stores that I can be in. And then after that, I want to go global. But I haven't actually made any plans to go global. But for some reason through LinkedIn, I have been approached by, you know, the biggest pharmaceutical company in Korea. And in the last 50 years, I've turned over... 730 billion US. So I think for me, you know, at the moment, I love Coco Lucas a lot. It's taken me 33 years to born this baby. I, I'm very in love with it. I want maybe one day Coco or Sophia will take over it. So I do want to keep the majority of the shareholding, but I'm a very open person. But it has to be for me to sell part of my shares, it has to be the right partner. That person's got to have the same philosophy. That I the reason why I started. So it has to be the right partner. I am very open. I would never say no or never. Never know. You never, yeah, never know what's know. next. Yes. And you have a great brand story and obviously a very positive personal profile. Giving back to the community is something we touched on earlier. So what what does it mean to you to be able to say give back through you know event, events like Refugee Week and other causes? Why is that so important to you? Well, for me, you know, I started by not knowing anything. As a little girl, I was lost. So I've only got here because I have great mentors in my life. So one of the, um, you know, organization I'm involved with is Global Sisters. Uh, I anonymously donate a lot to Agent Orange and the orphanage in my country, but I like to be anonymous and I donate for my own money. I don't really like asking people for money to raise money to donate. So for example, my latest project is Oz Harvest. So two years ago, I raised 2500 for Ronnie. 
And you know, I, I, the twelve and a half thousand that I, I raised, that I asked from friends, I eventually gave them all back because when they have a cherry, I need to return the money. I need to give them back. So I am working on a new exciting project for us harvesters about waste on war on food. So I wanted to say, I said to Ronnie, how about I make, I donate money to you every day, every month, and every year. So let's, you know, let's let's make turn. Uh, two days old bread into a bread of bar pudding. And then we're gonna, because you know, like for example, an organization like Os Harvest, Ronnie, she, she's an amazing person. And I really wanna partner with her. And I, I wanted to help her every day because when I come to see her, she's got all these food given to her and she's got, a, she's, she needs people to deliver them. That's right, it's a distribution and, uh, yeah. piece. So in 14 years, she's donated 65 million meals. So she's got 100 people on her payroll. So how does she fund all this? So I want to be the person who be who be part of the pioneer because I, I I will be giving her I will develop the range with her chef head chef Travis uh, I I know how you know the retailers work um, and I know about commercial finance and I'll be the manufacturer and the producer so I want to be on this journey very long with her and something that's sustainable so I want to constantly always give back. Absolutely. Well, that's very powerful. Uh, last couple of questions that I always ask my guests. The first one is, do you have any special mentors or inspirational people? And I know there's probably many, but one or two that you can think of and talk about. What have they taught you about business and life? Okay. Uh, one of my greatest mentors is my uh, late grandfather, um, and I've never met him. But I asked a lot of questions about him because when I went to Vietnam three years ago, I asked my uncle, how does grandpa has two wives and got 17 children to feed? And he said, you know, your grandpa has always owned a lot of land. And, um, you know, I've always learned from him, like we Chinese. So I think my grandpa always pride a lot on philosophy, honesty, loyalty, and um, reputation. Because my grandfather said that if your reputation is not strong or reputable, no one does business with you. It's so true. It's yeah, so true. The people so, who last are the ones that have those values yeah, that you so, talk about. So, so I think I've always incorporated that in my business, that I've always shown, I will always respect people. So my grandfather has shown us to be respectful to people when we do business. And I'm actually quite traditional. So in traditional as in like, if I have a guest coming from Korea, I'll pick them up from the airport. I, I take them out to dinners. If they stay here for four days, I'll take them to a different dinner every single night. I drive them around. So I'm very traditional and old-fashioned how I do business. We should business. come to stay at your house for the sounds of it. Yes. That sounds amazing. <laughs> so I'll book their hotels for them. So I'm very hospitable, you know. And uh, I think um, we, we as humans, we never stop learning. So that's what I learned from my grandfather is to have a very, very solid reputation. Uh, and then Brian Harris is one of my mentors and my mentors don't see me all the time they probably see me once a month and I don't always ask them questions each month but he has taught me to run a debt-free business so when you have a business that's debt-free it's a very good business you know and he's very hard on me so keeps I, you accountable yeah so he keeps me accountable and then I have another mentor which is you know um, um, Warren McLean and he is like a briefing encyclopedia so he teaches me how to be own exclusivity, which is also very powerful. And, and you know, least but not last is my husband. I share everything with him. So I, I share everything with him, the good times, the bad times. We make all the decisions together. So he, he's really a mentor to me every single day. Powerful. So yeah. two, two people from your family and two from beyond. So yes. that, that's great tips for people. Mm -hmm. Finally, to wrap up, what are sort of the top two or three learnings that you'd love to share with the listeners about the politics of kids' food? What can we be doing today to help our kids eat better? You know, I think um, one thing I, I, um, I, I sort of, although I know a lot about food, one thing I, I did mistake was I didn't actually give my food the, kid, the foods that I don't eat which is not right because I think from the very beginning, we should feed them everything that you cook for yourself. So to train them to, to eat, eat widely and broadly and variety. And, and broadly yeah. and be creative yes. and you know, just so you, you don't have the, the heartache of cooking a separate meal for them 
and the seven move for you. So Great from advice. the very beginning, just let them have what you have. So it depends on the stages. So from the very beginning, I, I actually gave, I always make sure my kids have about four veggies, some meat and some carbs. And I, so it depends on the stages. So when they're young, you puree it. When they're next stage, puree it rough. And then eventually, let them have what you have. So they, they are trained from the palates to taste everything that you've eaten before. But I would always eliminate processed food and canned food. But I'm, one of, I'm not one of those mums that say no lollies. You know, I think it's good to be a bit relaxed. It's so, a good bit of balance in our bit lives. Bit of balance yes. because otherwise I, I don't believe in just eating 100% healthy. It's all right to be a bit naughty one day a week. We've got to live, don't yeah. we? Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you today in the politics of everything. If you want to connect further with DM, there'll be some details on our show notes. You've been listening to the politics of everything. Until next time, stay well. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network and your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests, so if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespokecoms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U, and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.